the different factors in the path. Discernment is the last to be perfected. But you have to begin with some discernment. Otherwise, the path wouldn't appeal to you at all. You have to see that you're suffering. You have to see that it may be dependent on your actions. Or maybe you don't focus so much on the suffering, but simply on the fact that the happiness you have doesn't satisfy. There must be something better. That's the beginning of discernment. And then the Buddha recommends that you go and ask someone who has attained true happiness what's skillful, what's not skillful, what's blameless, what's blameworthy. What when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness, and what when I do it will lead to my long-term harm and suffering. So the emphasis there is on your actions. What, what, what are you going to do that's going to make a difference? And this was the question the Buddha himself asked himself on his path to awakening. He would notice that he was suffering or not satisfied with his progress for some reason or another. And he tried to look and see if it was something in his own actions that was causing the problem. And then he began to realize that there was something he'd been doing that could possibly be the, the cause of what his dissatisfaction was. And so he's going to change his actions. And it's through changing his actions that he was able to attain awakening. So you want to take his example. Look at what you're doing. If there's something in life that's causing you distress or causing you dissatisfaction. What are you doing? What could you change? And then you look at his teachings for advice on what you might change in your life. It's all a guide to action. And the basic image that he gives of his teaching is of a path something you follow, something that you have to do, you have to engage in, in an active way. And all his various teachings, even the ones that seem very theoretical, the guides to action. See, the teaching on emptiness sounds awfully abstract. But basically the Buddha is saying, look at your meditation and see in your meditation what's causing any stress, any disturbance. And then when the mind settles into a deeper state, notice okay, it's empty of the disturbance it had before, but is there still some disturbance left? It's one way of appreciating the mind's various stages of concentration as you get deeper and deeper. And it's also a reminder that these states of ease, states of well-being, are the results of actions. One of the big mistakes you can make in meditation is you hit something really spacious and really blissful. You say, ah, this must be it. This is the ground of being, or this is some other cosmic principle. And you neglect to see, what did you do? to get there? And is there still some disturbance there? The teaching of not-self is also a guide to action. You look all, at all your various senses of self and see them as actions. And the question is, which ones are you going to use and which ones are you going to have to put aside? A lot of the meditation is just this, sorting out which ones are useful, which ones are not. 
and how long they're going to be useful, and at what point you have to get them up. There's a teaching in psychology that divides the functions of the mind into what they call id, ego, and superego. And from the point of view of psychology, there's always going to be a struggle there. The id is just your raw desires, and raw desires don't really care about consequences. They just want what they want right now. And then your superego is your sense of what you should do, and it doesn't care whether you want something or not. You just got to do it because you should. And then you've got the ego, which is trying to negotiate between these two intransigent forces. And it's doomed from the start. In terms of modern psychology, there's no real happiness. It's just kind of a splitting of the difference. But the Buddha doesn't see the mind that way. But he does talk about things you need to do in order to negotiate. You've got your short-sighted desires, and you've got your wiser desires for happiness. They're all alike in that they want happiness. It's just that some of them don't look at the long-term consequences or are, or are deluded about the long-term consequences. We're just really hungry for a little, little satisfaction right now. And then there's a part of you that really does care about the long-term consequences, and you've got, to you've got to negotiate. And so in the negotiation, you're going to have to use your various senses of self, your strategic ones, the ones that are based on a sense of heedfulness, the ones that know how to provide some pleasure in the present moment so that the impulses you have that want some pleasure right now can find some satisfaction. This is one of the reasons why we do concentration practice. You breathe in, breathe out, and there's a sense of ease right there. And you want to learn how to appreciate that. It's ease that doesn't cost any money, doesn't cause any problems, doesn't weigh on it yourself or on other beings at all. It just requires some skill. But as you develop the skill, there's something you can tap into. It gives you strength, gives you nourishment, so that when you have to say no to your short-sighted desires, you can give them an alternative kind of happiness, something right away. It's through the practice of concentration that restraint becomes possible, and it becomes a it doesn't become a burden. It becomes something that you can do and not feel strung out. And the other healthy ego functions, compassion or altruism and humor, they have to come in as well. So it's not a burden, it doesn't become something really hard to take. The sense of humor is really important. It's your ability to laugh at yourself, not in a nasty way, but in a good-natured way, to admit that, yeah, you do have these defilements, and some of them are pretty dumb, and yet, yet you like them. You've been training them, you've been keeping them as pets in your house for a long time. And if you can approach them with humor, the whole business of restraint is a lot easier. This is one of the reasons why in the Vinaya the rules for the monks often have origin stories, and the origin stories often have a lot of humor. So you can recognize human foibles. The human race has not changed that much in 2,500 years. And you can see the excuses that the monks give and the strange reasoning they go through, and you recognize, oh, you've seen that in your own mind. And seeing that helps you to distance yourself from it. That's a lot of what humor is. It's being able to distance yourself from things that would otherwise pull you in the wrong direction. And yet you do it in a way that's not repressive. I mean, there's no denial. But 
but your ability to develop all these various functions. These are all the different kinds of selves you're going to need for a while. These are your self-strategies. And use them. Recognize them as actions, something you choose to do. And then recognize when you have to put them aside. That's what the not-self strategy is all about. It's like having tools and then knowing when to put the tools down. And so all these teachings, which are generally regarded as fairly abstract, they're actually guides to action. Guides to seeing where your actions have been causing suffering, causing stress, getting in the way of true happiness, and seeing how you can change. This is why the Buddha's categorical teachings are all framed in terms of actions. Teaching on skillful and unskillful actions, teachings on the Four Noble Truths. The reason I ask Four Noble Truths is because there are four duties with regard to stress. You want to comprehend the stress, you want to abandon its cause, you want to realize its cessation and develop the path to the cessation. Four different things you've got to do. That's why he has four truths. In other words, they're guides to action. Guides to where you focus your energy and then realizing what you've got to do when you recognize that one of those truths is presenting itself to you. So this is what discernment is all about. It's about action, what you're doing, because this is what really makes a difference. This is where you're really responsible. The Buddha said this is a sign of a wise person is knowing what you're responsible for, what you really do have to take on as a burden, and what you don't. There are lots of things out there that you don't have to take on a burden as a burden. What are you really? That's something you don't have to worry about. How about the nature of the world? Was there somebody out there that created it? Do they have a plan? That's not your responsibility. What is your responsibility is what you're doing right now, realizing it's going to have consequences right now and on into the future. That's an important part of discernment is one learning how to frame things so that you can focus on what really is your responsibility. And how to keep your priorities straight. So we're focusing on our actions. And where do our actions come from? They come from the mind. Activities in the mind. This is why we have to train the mind to develop the mindfulness and the alertness it's going to need so it can watch its actions and really see what you're doing and what the results are of what you're doing. And then you develop that ardency to try to do all of this well. So whatever you encounter in terms of the Buddha's teachings, always remember this has to do with action in one way or another. And if you can figure out how the particular teaching it relates to the choices you're making, that's when you get the most benefit out of it. <laughs>